Publica Foundation. My name is Wojciech Przybylski. I'm very pleased to have you all here today at uh, our uh, first debate of a series. The, this series is a series of discussions uh, with members of the European Parliament. It's a new series at Visegrad Insight that is part of a cooperation project, uh, a grant with the European Me Parliament, a media grant with the European Parliament. And um, uh, this discussion is on the record, hence you, you may see there is a, um, there is a sign that says uh, recording, you, you, you find it there. And uh, today uh, we're discussing the state of media freedom and the takes and positions uh, in the European Parliament on, on that subject. We have fantastic speakers, as I mentioned today with us, uh, who are deeply engaged in the, uh, in the in this topic at hand, the question of media freedom um, in the European Union overall, but with particular focus uh, today, of course, we are sitting in, in Warsaw and they are joining us from, from Slovakia, from Hungary, from uh, Berlin, I suppose. Um, Germany, wherever you are, Sergey, indeed. I mean, I, it's a virtual background, I see, but it looks very nice. Um, uh, Anna Donat uh, Momentum, uh, Renew Europe, Vice President of Renew Europe, and Michal Simeczka, um, also Vice President, Renew Europe, uh, Progressive Slovensko, and Sergey Lagodinsky, uh, German Greens, and, and also a member of the, of the Green uh, political family in the European Parliament. And today on the hot topic uh, of, of um, of media. Uh, as I mentioned, we are uh, deeply engaged in it, not only because we are media, we are analyzing the situation. We've been uh, releasing reports on information sovereignty, a uh, question that, uh, or the, the topic or the, the theme of uh, information sovereignty is usually picked up by the so-called populists in, um, in the European Union, uh, who usually say that, you know, we are lacking the information sovereignty, hence the governments need to have more to say, to more to control in the, in the media in the stakeholder business. But uh, we turn the table and uh, indeed, uh, following also a very important interview with Timothy Snyder on that, spe specifically on that term, information sovereignty, we uh, we turn the table and, and we say, no, yes, information sovereignty is important. Information uh, sovereignty is important, but in a, in a different perspective. And this is the first question to the panel to, to begin the discussion. Uh, sovereignty of in, information sovereignty. Uh, okay, if we say yes, uh, people generally, you know, European Union also discusses a, a lot about sovereignty. But is it sovereignty of the governments or sovereignty of the people and how to ensure it is the right one? Um, Anna Donat, would you begin? Thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me. It's, um, it's. I think uh, this, the, the topic of today is one of the most important right now for for us who are doing politics in Central Europe, because without uh, free media, without media pluralism, uh, we cannot talk about democracies. And, uh, and 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 what is most important to 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 fight for democracy day by day basis. Uh, about information uh, sovereignty, uh, of course, by definition, is a framework uh, in which free, independent, and pluralistic journalism can flourish. Uh, however, in, in, in Central Europe, uh, hybrid regimes, just like ours, uh, Viktor Orban's regime in Hungary, uh, are abusing this term and invoke, uh, it, invoke it as a staff to justify media control. Public media and uh, media close to the governments, I, I fin uh, financially supported and used as government mouthpieces rather than serving plurality and carrying um, uh, and, and, and carrying out information. Um, autocratic politicians seeming to view free media as an as an opponent rather than the fundamental aspect of free society. While media freedom and pluralism are part of the rights and principles and enshrined in, in the European Charter of Fundamental Rights and in the European Convention on, on Human Rights. Um, I don't know how much you, you know about the Hungarian situation. Uh, basically, we can say that media freedom only exists on paper um, and much of the media is concentrated in one hand. In the past 10 years, Orban crushed the Hungarian uh, media market and silenced oppositions he did uh, not like. Um, uh, constitutionally, separation of power and media freedom only exist on, on paper, um, uh, but, uh, but they uh, created 
um, a so-called uh, uh, Keshma, which is uh, the Central European Press and Media Foundation, which uh, basically 400 media outlets has been donated to one foundation. Uh, the nation is, is, is not known in competition law, so it helped avoiding any competition law proceedings. Basically, uh, the existence of Keshma is the proof that uh, the only reason why it happened uh, is because the oligarchs who bought up uh, the, the, the media landscape um, uh, got something back. Uh, this is why this example is really important for us right now uh, when we are talking about the rule of law mechanism because basically they use European funds in order to do that. Uh, and, and this is an example uh, when we can use how uh, EU funds are misused in Hungary and how it's end up in corruption. It's just one example of, 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 of the all. Uh, and another important thing to, um, um, to, to mention um, is uh, um, uh, the independence of the Media Council, which we cannot talk about it anymore in Hungary, as it's only filled with Fidesz nominated members and all opposition nomination got rejected. Uh, I have submitted a complaint to the Commission about uh, breaching the audiovisual services directive and its requirements for independence and impartiality of the media authority. Um, I don't know how long should I go, but I, I think I'm going to give it to, 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 to the others to answer to this question. Yeah, we will have, uh, we'll try to ensure uh, most lively debate possible, given, given, you know, it's happening online. And I wanted to turn immediately to Sergei. Thank you, Anna, for, for your introductory uh, comments uh, and, and answer to the question. And I understand you underlined that the uh, yeah, it is sovereignty of the people, information sovereignty of, of, of the society, having access to information to control the government, not the vice versa, not the, not, not the other way around, that is being uh, sold as the, you know, by the, again, uh, so-called sovereignists um, in the European Union. But now let me turn to, to Sergei, and, and you've been following on, in general, the, uh, the, the question of democracy, and you've been very much committed in, the, in your previous think tank uh, assignment also to, to, the, to the state of, of you, you would say, democratic security. Uh, in, uh, in also looking at it at, uh, in Europe. How do you look at it? I'm, I mean, nobody speaks of problems with media freedoms in Germany currently, or am I mistaken? But uh, there is a lot of discussion, this sea level discussion on, um, on in the European Parliament. How important it is from your perspective? I think it's, a, it's an important point in any case. And um, uh, the question is uh, what kind of uh, terms and what kind of references we want to frame it within. And um, as someone, as you mentioned, who is kind of trying to compare the situation, and I think we live in parallel um, in parallel universes of authoritarianism versus democracy. And I'm also watching what has been going on, for example, in Russia or in Turkey, and try to compare it, what stage we are <laughs> in. Um, and I would uh, personally caution uh, using the terms that have been poisoned or abused by uh, authoritarian regimes. I think that uh, using sovereignty um, as a term uh, to talk about uh, basically democratic resilience, uh, probably, uh, is, is something that could lead us in a, in a wrong, to the wrong path. Of course, it is clear that um, uh, uh, sovereignty in the sense that we mean it belongs to the people and not to the state. But the problem is that the state manipulates and instrumentalizes the people's sovereignty. And they can always reframe it in a way that they, uh, to their liking. So uh, when um, uh, with the, the state uh, um, authoritarian would like to push back and away uh, from let's say, you know, we, we, we don't have to talk about informational sovereignty. You can talk about civil society sovereignty in Hungary. They can say we're pushing back against American influence of the open society uh, uh, foundation because we want to protect our uh, uh, sovereignty of the civil society. And this is our goal and, uh, and our task. So I would rather not use the sovereignty uh, term in that uh, regard, also not for Germany. <laughs> and in Germany, of course, the issue of sovereignty is also historically, uh, I wouldn't say charged, but something that people are interested in talking about, you know, the, the long uh, retained and, and uh, ob obtained back sovereignty in after the reunification and, and how do we, we go about that. 
But I would say that in Germany, we're also watching very closely the situation with the freedom of media, because uh, if you want to start uh, talking about resilience, you have to start talking about resilience before it's too late, before we get to the situation as we have, unfortunately, Anna in, uh, in Budapest or in, in, um, in Hungary overall. Uh, we need to equip our uh, media landscape so that things like that don't happen. And what we have is, for example, the question of plurality of media in Germany. Uh, we do have, if we look at the index of plurality of media on the federal level, it's quite uh, uh, good. But if you look on the, on the local level, and you start looking at the local levels, there you would start having problems. And this is something that we have to address already now, how to keep uh, the plurality of media uh, on the lender level, so on the federal states level or on local level, because in many cases you have two or three newspapers printed and they are in one hand, uh, even though they, they make an impression that, that it's, uh, it's, it's a, it's a plural, plural society. Another point is supporting public media, public uh, TV, which is a, a good institution, a functioning institution in Germany, but it's an institution that is costly. And that's where, especially during times of crisis, we would have and already are having our discussions. So also with the, the, the view of the European Union and our neighbors, how can we strengthen public TV as an alternative to state TV? And I will end here as a first input. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Th Sergey. And now I'm turning to Michal, uh, with whom we had a very good chat last week. Also, there is an interview with Michal that appeared at Visegrad Insight, also on the main, um, main opinion leading uh, portal on NetPL, uh, on the question of rule of law, but also on the question of media. It was actually on the day of, uh, of, of the discussion and the debate in the European Parliament um, on media freedom, especially in the case of Poland and Hungary and Slovenia. Michal, uh, just to re recapitulate the, the main points of, of, of what you are making and what is the debate in the European Parliament about media freedom about? Wh how, how do you define, how do you define the, the battlefield for the free media in, in the European uh, Parliament? What are the most important points from, from your point of view. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks, Wojciech, and, uh, and thanks so much for, for being able to, to be here with uh, my distinguished colleagues. It's in, indeed an honor. Um, many of you perhaps have, have uh, seen the debate that, that, that we had in the European Parliament with Vice President Jurova. And it was interesting because, and it's also, it's, it's frustrating. It's very frustrating because almost every speaker from the European Parliament uh, mention, you know, what we all know, um, the case of Club Radio in Hungary as a culmination uh, of, of a trend of, of uh, basically destroying uh, free media uh, in the country. Uh, most people have mentioned the situation in Poland with the new tax. Uh, a lot of people refer to Adam Michnik's essay. Um, the same number of people also refer to the problems in Slovenia with, you know, the aggressive push by the prime minister against the, the press agency and, and attacks on journalists. Um, and in fact, the, the vice uh, president of the commission herself referred to these countries. But everybody sort of was at a loss to, to say what the European Union can do. Uh, and even she was struggling. I mean, she was says, saying that, if I remember correctly, that, well, the commission is investigating, monitoring the situation closely, looking at the different options. But it was clear from the debate, and it's clear in the room, that the European Union does not have a tool that you can pinpoint and say, well, this is uh, what the what the EU, what the Commission can do when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to undermining uh, media pluralism or free uh, or free media and uh, one can, one member state or more member states. She she alluded to some sort of a new tool that could be that could be developed, but that was kind of still left vague. So, and I think this is this is the crux of the matter: is that everybody sees the problem, everybody understands how um, how consequential it is. Uh, for for democracy, if um, if if the space for free media or or uh, free journalists is, is shrinking, everybody's kind of aware that that this leads to um, the destruct ultimately the destruction of liberal democracy. Uh, but unlike when it comes to the rule of law and judicial independence, everybody also also sees that the European Union is is essentially cannot do anything at this point, which uh, to my mind is not entirely true. Uh, to my mind, there are tools that the European Union could do, could could deploy, having to do with state aid, 
you know, using the, 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 uh, the internal market um, legal basis um, and also actually using Article 2 much, much more robustly. But uh, my hope is that that debate and that promise also of, of Vice President Jourova that she will look for new tools that are actually um, that bite in a way or uh, tools that, that can, can uh, you know, deter such behavior. To my mind, that was perhaps, I hope, the moment when uh, the EU as such and the Commission in particular will start taking the issue seriously because there's accumulation of trends in Poland, Hungary, Slovenia. Um, uh, so, so it's no, no longer just Hungary. Um, so, so I really hope that, uh, that we'll soon see some kind of a new instrument that, uh, that uh, the European Union can, um, can do to protect journalists. I mean, there are many um, sort of small, not smaller things, but many uh, issues that deal with particulars such as, you know, SLAP and, and, and the new directive there, such as more funding to independent journalists uh, from, from the EU budget. Uh, but, but I think the problem is systemic and therefore it would be good if any new tool is, is systemic. And what everybody reiterated, uh, and I think the commission is aware as well, that these are sort of interrelated problems that what you see in Poland with the, for example, uh, with the destruction of independent uh, judiciary and uh, with, with the assault on minorities say that that comes to fundamental rights, it goes hand in hand with an attack on the independent media because it's part of the same context and part of the same, uh, well, political program in a way. Uh, and unless also the Commission and the EU start seeing this in, in, in seeing the problems and seeing the situations in its member states in such a holistic and interconnected fashion, I think we'll still be kind of uh, fumbling uh, the response. So, but I, but I really would like to hope that that um, debate and, and the momentum that's building behind protecting uh, free media and the EU uh, is a turning point in a way. Michal, in the interview, in the conversation we had last week, you mentioned that the EU should be providing, should be protecting the right to access uh, information access all across the board. But is that something being really debated seriously in, in, the, in the European Parliament? Uh, or, you know, you're, that's something that uh, you're proposing? Uh, the, the right to have access to information, not from the state institutions, but, you know, being provided and again, I, I refer here vaguely to the term information sovereignty. I understand Sergei will, will again oppose, and he has good reasons, but still uh, the access of people to the information. And that comes with the number of journalists who can live off their profession freely, independently of, of the government. Is that something that you should pick up on and more? Well, of course, that's the basic kind of premise. And this is, um, uh, you know, th th this is one, I mean, if, if you think about it, this along with, uh, uh, all the other sort of founding values, as we as we call them in the EU, this certainly is 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 right up there. The question is how to operationalize it, how to uh, what the EU can do to ensure that every EU citizen, be it Polish or or Hungarian or, or Slovak, actually uh, has uh, can access that right in practice, not just in theory. Uh, and this is what I this is what I was referring to that the that the that there are kind of different legal uh, opinions on how to do that, what's possible under the current. Uh, treaty setup. Uh, my hope is that uh, at some point, um, perhaps it could be part of the, and hopefully will be part of the conference on the future of Europe, uh, to you know to be able to stand on solid legal ground when defending that right uh, from the Commission's perspective, because this is obviously what they're worried about, that um, that uh, that they will lose a case uh, at the European Court of Justice, for instance, if if um, uh, it, that they would file, say, on uh, on. Uh, it, whether whether it concerns Hungary or Poland and it concerns journalists which are being silenced or media which are being shut down and the commission sort of comes out in force and they lose the case because the legal ground is not solid enough. I think this is what they're very, very concerned about. Uh, I, I think they should overcome this concern because the, the situation is pretty critical. Um, but, uh, but so far we, the commission hasn't come up and, and to be honest, it's the commission's uh, at this point uh, um, main responsibility and it's on that to, to come up with a response. I mean, the parliament has, has put all the pressure, has put the proposals on the table, has put the pressure on the commission. Uh, and, and I would really hope that, uh, that, that they would come with something substantive because the European action plan on democracy, which is, and the, or the rule of law report, all of this is good and fine, but there are more sort of soft, term, many of them are soft measures and very few of them are actually attacking the problem, which is governments trying to dismantle free media so as not to be disturbed and not to be criticized and to be able to push through their agenda. 
So even the European Action Plan on Democracy deals with disinformation and all that, but that doesn't quite cut to the core of, of you know, what, what, what the problem is. Uh, but, um, uh, well, I mean, there's the promise that the, the Commission will find a new tool, um, hopefully, uh, hopefully soon. Once you come back on the information sovereignty one bit, if, if I may, uh, and then I'll give the floor to others. I think this is a very flawed concept, to be honest, and a, and a very out, outdated one. To, the, the idea that there are national or state's interest and its sovereignty that needs to be protected and pursued by having kind of national ownership of the media or, or uh, you know, only um, kind of national narrative that would be cultivated if uh, media are owned by uh, national companies or, 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 or can, under control of the state. I think this is kind of, you know, 19th century sort of stuff um, in, in today's world. Actually, in Slovakia, I used to be a journalist when I was younger. And the most editorial freedom that newspapers and including the newspaper I was working on, uh, working at had was then when, when they were under German ownership because the German officers didn't care about Slovak politics. So, so they wouldn't actually interfere with the editorial, uh, with the editorial work. And it might not be uh, that foreign ownership is, uh, is, is always good. And it might be, it, it does, the point is it shouldn't matter. What should matter is that the, uh, the, a democratic government uh, puts in place a framework that protects that editorial freedom and that uh, you know creates the conditions for for journalists to, to for journalists to work freely regardless of how how the media uh, are owned mm -hmm. thanks thanks so much I'm turning now to Anna um, uh, looking at the at the points that also Michal raised at the at the end he mentions uh, that the, the questions of media freedom me, media plurality, coincide uh, often now, at, also in the European Parliament, with the debates on disinformation, malign foreign influence. Um, and then in the report that I mentioned, we, we produced a year ago, in fact, with scenarios of what is happening to the media market in Central Europe, what may happen in the, in the course, you know, through also different crises, uh, following also re reports of the Oxford Reuters Institute, we see that with this capturing of media in Hungary, the level of, um, let's say, alignment to the Kremlin-sponsored disinformation in Hungary from national state TV is increasing. Do you see connection or is the European Parliament, you know, looking at these two to, to be connected uh, in any way in, in, the, in the debate, in the legislation that you're, um, you're following? How much do you see that as a problem or, or an angle from which you can approach the same, the very same problem of, of lacking media freedom? Well, I, I, I see a connection. However, I believe that we should in the European Parliament focusing a little bit more about national disinformation than foreign interference, uh, like this information coming through foreign interference, because uh, unfortunately our government doesn't need uh, Russian disinformation in order to create a parallel university. Uh, and in this point, I, I, I have to echo uh, Sergei uh, how much I also hate to use the word sovereignty because basically it's the keywords for autocrats. Every time when they want to centralize more their power, they use the, uh, the, the flag of uh, are we just doing it to protect our sovereignty and sovereign interest. Uh, and of course, uh, funnily enough, even these autocrats can use the card to pinpoint on, um, on uh, foreign interference and they are protecting national inter. Uh, 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 interest in this uh, in this regard however it basically only means that they just want to 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 spread their own propaganda which builds on the same model as we can see in Russia and of course there are um, um, uh, a lot of interconnection however I think uh, Europe has to start paying attention to this information within its borders. They have to pay attention that not all the member states' leadership uh, are in line with the European interest and with the European regulation. And to just a little bit refer what what Michal said, there are many things that uh, in the EU, the Commission could do, and they are not doing yet. So we have to be, as a parliament, uh, a little bit louder and, and, and more critical towards, and not because we have any problems with, with the commission, it's because we have to work together. And it's not enough that, uh, that we are allowed in the parliament. It's not enough to organize uh, debates in every second or third plenary session uh, about media freedom. 
because there could be a solution. Uh, the, the Commission could create the rules for transparency of media ownership, as it was mentioned many times, it's one of the roots of the problems. And, uh, and the Commission could also ensure the independence of media councils. Uh, they would have the right for that. And I think there's something really important coming up uh, with the new uh, DMO uh, uh, regulation, the Digital Mar uh, Markets Act, uh, because from a competition uh, low perspective, there's a lot that EU can do in order to help to protect media freedom. Uh, for instance, just one little thing. Uh, right now, uh, I think in all those countries like Hungary, uh, but nowadays we can say about Poland and Slovenia and so on and so forth, um, uh, basically social media is the only sphere which uh, independent media can reach out. And social media helps a lot to, um, uh, to, to, to give visibility uh, however, it's not enough what's happening in order to protect the, the sustainability of the uh, uh, free media. Uh, therefore, there should be an agreement on how social media uh, can help and can support uh, independent media as it's using its contents. So there are many tools in our hands. It depends on us and the European decision makers how uh, uh, these tools can be more effective in order to protect media freedom. And of course, it's all gonna uh, uh, help Help, uh, to fight against disinformation and foreign interference as well. Yeah, I, I still wonder how are you going to persuade the European Commission to take a stance here, and and how how what are the practical steps ahead? But uh, I mean, all your points are very very valid indeed. Uh, Anna, any well, I'm sorry, but I think it's also it's also the uh, the job of the Parliament to uh, uh, to to, um, uh, to 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 face the Commission because the Commission has to report back to the Parliament, not to the Council. So I mean, just because before the previous terms, the Parliament were not strong enough in order to stood up and and pressure the Commission, it doesn't mean that in the future it cannot be possible. So I think that's this from this moment on, it's all about politics. Okay, I see Michal, quick response to that. Yeah, just, just uh, to, to pick up on where Anna left, I mean, one of the tools, obviously, from, from the repertoire is, is uh, you know, when you, when, you look at, um, when you look at efforts by governments, and specifically comes to Poland and Hungary, to kind of starve out um, you know, independent private media uh, by withdrawing sort of advertising and to direct advertising only to kind of public or stained-owned um, stained media. That's, again, something where the Commission could act uh, uh, because it's uh, because it's distorting the market, right? And and this is one just one example. And there there are many, but uh, but again, it, it comes down on you know the commission's weighing the risk of losing uh, versus what we think, me and Anna and, and I'm sure Sergey and the entire parliament is the the risk of not acting um, because uh, obviously we will encourage those governments to 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 carry on with this. Mm -hmm. Thanks, uh, Sergey. I'll I'll have more. I mean, additional question apart from obvious, uh, you know, the comments you want to make to to your to the previous two statements, uh, also that you're coming from another grouping than than the previous two. And we did try to to provide another speaker from ECR for that matter, just to make the this debate even more pluralistic. But unfortunately, with with some friendliness, he he declined. He had another committee. Um, we'll try, of course, um, uh, keep keep the plurality within our debates uh, also ongoing, which is, I mean, we, we, we always do. But Sergei, to you, the question, apart from, you know, commenting on the previous statements, what do you think, you know, if you look from the big picture, again, uh, I'm relating to your transatlantic experience, you, you mentioned you're looking at media systems and, and democracy systems all around the world. We know that in 2008, media system as we knew it uh, lived through a shock, major shock related to advertising that was built on the, a long uh, um, overlooked uh, development of how you know, important internet is in all, in all of these things. Uh, now we're living through another shock, in fact, with the pandemic, I mean, we're exactly one year into the pandemic, has been uh, bringing down, in, I mean, immensely uh, revenues of, of, from advertisement, not to mention paper distribution of media, which is without the governments uh, being present and policies being present, uh, is undermining a very weak position of media. Local media, to start with, uh, you, you made excellent remarks. This is the core, this is the fundament of, of democratic security. But uh, what the European Parliament, in your opinion, or Europe overall, should do to ensure that media uh, keeps on being the, the fundamental uh, element of the 
uh, of democracy. I mean, democracy can can democracy even survive without media? I don't think so. Yeah, well, on, on, on that, I don't have to answer because <clears throat> since I don't represent ECR. Um, uh, <laughs> no, I wasn't referring. No, no. <laughs> that media is part of democracy. Um, uh, no, but uh, it's, it's, seriously, I think, I think we have to be here a little bit uh, systemic and systematic in our answering and also watch not to overpromise. Because I think one of the pro problems that we're facing now is that we um, start also the European Parliament, as, as uh, Michael mentioned it, I think in the interview, being the, the good conscience of the uh, European Union, um, granted, but um, when I see uh, what we can cause on um, expectations that are not realistic and not, not deliver, then sometimes I even think maybe we should be a little bit more timid in our promises. And I think one point is that uh, um, dealing with the media issues, I, I'm not sure as a lawyer, being a constitutional lawyer myself, I, I'm not sure we would be able to um, break it down to uh, a subjective individual right of a citizen uh, uh, for media plurality. This is very difficult. I don't think we would be able to, to drag a state into court uh, uh, if a citizen says, you know, you you have forbidden this or that press outlet, and that have infringed on my right of information, I think this is a this is a stretch. But where I think the legal uh, opportunity lies is that Article Two indeed covers democracy, and I think this is not so much an, an, an a matter of uh, uh, individual fundamental rights of citizens. Uh, it's a, a matter of individual fundamental rights of outlets themselves in the, in the sense of freedom of press. This is something that the press outlets do have a right themselves if they, uh, it is being infringed on. This is number one. And number two is this is, of course, an, precisely what you said, an integral part of uh, the pluralist system and, and, and media and opinion pluralism in a, in a functioning democracy. And this is where we should be pushing the commission uh, to look into ways of how to go about that. Uh, um, uh, the commission is indeed not very um, eager uh, to, they're very uh, timid. I think that this is, this is the problem with the, this commission, particular commission generally, and maybe colleagues could uh, um, agree on that, that we have, we, we basically drag them all the time uh, uh, to the courts on issues of rule of law. So maybe we should start dragging them to the courts on issues of democracy, of other democratic uh, uh, dimensions like uh, media pluralism. Uh, so this is number one. Number two, uh, maybe we should explore other instruments. Uh, um, uh, for example, I mean, we, we, we have to start uh, um, increasing the uh, ownership transparency generally. Uh, and, and also apply this also in the media realm. Uh, we uh, should uh, look into a competition law and in how much uh, centralization uh, of media in one hand also infringes on, on those and maybe also adjusting the thresholds because we're talking there not about huge uh, uh, media but smaller amounts of money and we need to adjust maybe the legislative uh, uh, framework on that. And we should also uh, look into the DSA in the, in the framework of DSA regulations on how we want to go about political ads and ads generally in the, in the uh, realm of digital. Uh, um, because I'm afraid uh, that we will not be able, even with our democratic spirit, we will not be able in the long term to save the print media. Uh, and the next uh, field of combat will be uh, the media online. Um, again, we see this in the very despotic and totalitarian countries, but maybe this is a warning for us uh, um, regarding the future of countries that are on the edge and members of the European Union. Uh, we also uh, should look maybe into legislation on anti-dumping um, uh, in how far ads uh, provided by public sources and, and public actors are an illegal uh, um, intervention by state in the free market of media. 
uh, this, these are points that I, I think, you know, if you go through them systematically, there is a whole agenda on how we can act, even with the commission, which is lacking the will of uh, being judicially activist and, 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 and court um, um, and active. Uh, so we, we need uh, to, to have a systemic and systematic approach based on, and I think I'll come back to that, Article 2, and, and what, what Michael also mentioned, Article 2 is not just rule of law and not just fundamental freedoms. Article 2 is also democracy. And media freedom is part of our democracy, the way we see it, the liberal democracy of the European Union. Thank you, Sergey. And I'm uh, now, again, announcing the possibility to ask questions through the chat box. In fact, there are many comments and questions, and I'm going to pick a few uh, in the discussion now. But also, uh, raise your hands, your, your virtual hands. I, I not necessarily see everyone on the screen if they are just waving. But um, in, the, um, in the participants box, um, you can raise your hand, you can signal to me, or you can write in the chat box that you want to give a comment or, or ask a question. And we still have uh, 20 minutes to go. So there will be some time uh, for some of you to, uh, to do that. And I will immediately pick on Stefan Schwed's um, uh, com one of the comments. He made uh, three excellent ones, I believe. And, uh, and, and this one he directs to Michal and Anna, he asks, following up in a way, I mean, he asked this question even before Sergei uh, spoke now, but, uh, are competition tools or any other mechanisms that protect the market of any use in your opinion when it comes to protecting balance of the media landscape? How much value do these instruments offer have? How much would you like to refer to them in your, uh, in your political initiative in the European Parliament? Anna? Uh, well, I, I, I believe the most important is that uh, uh, competition law should be used to stop autocratic governments funneling public funds to their own uh, on, on media because this distorts media markets. So this is uh, uh, for once it's uh, for sure can be done. Um, to, to be honest, um, uh, competition uh, um, uh, law or, or competition tools are not the, my, the cup of my expertise. Uh, however, uh, I believe that, that uh, there could be like stronger regulation from a European level in order to create, as I already mentioned, the transparency of the media uh, ownership, uh, as well as, uh, as uh, the public uh, broadcaster, the, the funding of public broadcasters, because I know that it's a national uh, uh, competence uh, level. However, in these countries where, where uh, public broadcasters are not serving the public interest and uh, it, it, it it's, uh, it's only a mouse piece of, uh, of uh, government propaganda, then I think obviously uh, it, uh, we, we have to, to start regulating it in a sense to, to as, as, as Miha said at the beginning, uh, we can't talk about anymore and national level, uh, uh, national ownerships and so on is not necessarily going to, to protect the, uh, the right to information and, and, and especially not uh, uh, media sovereignty. All right, uh, Michal, uh, how much do you see of, of use in your political initiatives uh, of, of these instruments? Um, yes, th thanks, Wojciech, and thanks, Stefan, for, for the question. I mean, this has already, to some extent, been, been addressed by, by Sergei. I mean, you have a number of legal avenues, uh, be it for precisely, as, as, I, as I mentioned, sort of discriminatory application of state advertising, you know, uh, depriving advertising um, uh, to uh, independent media and uh, actually giving it en masse to, to, to government media, uh, you know, anti-competitive behavior. You could perhaps um, um, in investigate when it comes to, you know, funding of public certain public broadcasters or state broadcasters. You could say that, uh, or perhaps you can bring a case when it comes to Hungary, uh, uh, or, or the Club Radio case that this is a you know discriminatory, discriminatory uh, decision to strip them of the license. There, you can look at and you can look at the what has been happening in Poland with the uh, with Pekin uh, Orlen's purchase of, of media, whether that uh, whether that's you know in in, in line with uh, you know with, with the way we see competition um, in, in in the EU. These are all things that obviously would require smart lawyers and guts from the Commission to do. Um, and this comes back to, to, to what Sergei says. I, 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 there are experts who think it could be done, but it's going to be extremely risky. Um, and, as I, and as I said before, 
there is some merit to the commission's sort of cautiousness in the sense that I, I think they're overly cautious, but, uh, but as they would, as anybody from the commission sitting here would say, if we lose one case, it's a huge precedent and it sets us back years. That's their argument. And, and for a time I was kind of buying it, especially when it comes to, to, um, to, to areas which are not clearly defined, such as the rule of law, where they stand on firm ground. And for a long time, I was also kind of sympathetic to the argument that we should be careful because we can lose. But I think, and or at least in my mind, we have reached a point where sort of erring on the side of caution is too risky uh, when it comes to uh, independence of the media because the situation just keeps you know, getting worse and worse. Um, so, so, so there are many tools um, and this really requires sort of very, very uh, deep expertise in EU competition law, state aid rules uh, and all of that. Um, and, and that's one thing. And I think the commission has that capacity, has that expertise, and then re it requires some gumption from, from uh, and I think this would have to uh, somehow be also, you know, a political decision in a way um, um, by the commission to, to go for this. And my hope is that the parliament will finally kind of push them to do it. Thanks, Michal and Sergei. Before you obviously may relate to, to these points, uh, let me give the floor to two uh, participants who want to ask their uh, questions or give comments. So uh, edit is good first and then Natalia Jaba. Thank you, Wojtek, and thanks for all the panelists for the great insights. I have a very short uh, comment related to what Miha Shumechka said about the advertisement market and and it's going to be a question which is related to this for the whole panel. So, so despite this general impression that the Hungarian government is very legalistic in its approach, I have been arguing in my writings that Viktor Orban is very often using informal power while capturing the media. So for instance, he's inserting informal power in business actors uh, in order to distort the, the, the market, the advertisement market in South. And, there is a profound example that, for instance, the German automotive industry or the telecommunication, telecommunication industry would never risk advertising in non-governmental Hungarian media. And we don't know whether this is because of direct pressure from the regime or it's a self-censorship because the business actors are afraid of potential economic retaliation. But this okay. is how it works. Uh, well, in a very untransparent, uncodified way. And, and this is only one example of the many forms of informal power abuses in Hungary and Poland is following in the steps. And my question to all speakers is that, uh, how should the EU institutions address this type of informal exercise of power and power abuse? And what sort of infringement actions could be suitable? And would it be possible even without fundamentally reshuffling EU competences at all? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Edith. Uh, Natalia Jaba. Uh, thank you so much. It's a super important discussion. And uh, I'm very happy I can be here. Thank you, Wojtek, for, for giving me my voice. And um, uh, I'm a journalist, and I spent 10 years in the Balkan uh, region. Now I'm back in Poland. And what I'm observing in the media sector is just uh, leaving me with sleepless nights, you know, and uh, horror images in my head because we are heading into a very, very dramatic scenario when it comes to uh, democracy and the state of democracy. My question is, um, well, taking into consideration that the time has simply changed and none of the tools we are mentioning and we know that exist uh, in the EU are applicable actually to kind of um, uh, change, bring really real change to the situation. Mm -hmm. Is there, do, do you see any window uh, of opportunity, possibility to create new tools uh, within the EU Parliament or the Commission, like for example, financial tools to help up with the uh, news media organizations that are popping up right now or are, uh, you know, uh, present in the media sector, sector in Poland and Hungary? Balkan region, troubled the way it is, has much more right now uh, help than we do. And we are heading into that direction. So uh, I would be very interested in, in, in getting to know that kind of opportunities. Thank you. Thank you both for fantastic, uh, great questions. Uh, now, we obviously have too little time to address them, but to make it fair, everyone will get two minutes uh, to respond. So who would uh, who of you would uh, prefer to, to
to begin. Uh, should I um, ask uh, perhaps Sergey? Would you like to take the floor? Yes, yeah, thank you. And um, um, it, it, it's not going to be popular what I'm going to be saying now, but um, I think that we as European institutions should do everything we can uh, to provide help and assistance, but we will not be able to solve those problems. Uh, most of those problems will be able to solve uh, on to be solved only by the citizens and from from and the civil society and from within and the way i understand our mission is to strengthen the civil society and to give them an, a, a european option so for example um, um, my uh, report that i initiated and will be doing this month will be how to create uh, a european pan-european civil society with all the legal um, um, safeguards uh, that are possible. And the same we should do with media. So maybe uh, providing a foundation uh, that just as we have a foundation for European uh, uh, endowment, dem democracy endowment, a Polish invention, by the way, uh, for civil society in the neighborhood, we should go in the direction of creating a pool of finances that would assist to media under pressure within the European Union. This is, of course, a matter of competences and all bureaucracies, et cetera, et cetera. But this might be a good way uh, to go about this. And um, uh, regarding the uh, EU options, so that, as I mentioned, uh, there are options that we already have. I'm not sure whether we would be able to restructure the treaties, because in order to restructure the treaties, we would need the consent of those authoritarians whom we want to safeguard. Uh, and that's the biggest problem that we're having. That's the problem we had with the rule of law mechanism. Uh, and that's why this rule of law mechanism, to be honest, is so impotent uh, that, that we have at the, at the end. So uh, it will be kind of surgical strikes of safeguards and an attempt always to be on guard, but I'm not sure that we will be able to have a, a in German you say, a, 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 Wolf, a big throw, kind of a big thing uh, that would change uh, the situation dramatically coming from the European Parliament. Two years in the European Parliament and within European structures have made me a sober politician. Uh, well, Michal, do you want to respond also to that? Yeah, um, I, I tend to agree, but also not agree with, with, uh, with, with Sergei's um, realistic and slightly kind of uh, well, pessimistic, but sort of sober uh, analysis of what, the, what the EU can do or not do um, when it comes to protecting, um, well, protecting free media, protecting journalists, protecting civil society. Um, certainly there is the money um, and certainly there can be funds, there can be envelopes within, uh, with, with, within the, the, the normal European budget, within programs to, to support this. There can be more also legally done to protect journalists from sort of these predatory um, lawsuits and all that. I think there's a directive in the making and we've been sort of advocating for that. Um, and there are, yeah, bits and pieces here tinkering with competi competition law, which to, to, to sort of uh, stop some governments in their tracks. Uh, and maybe Sergei is right that, that there is no silver bullet. There is no brand new shiny instrument that the, the European uh, Commission or the European Parliament can sort of pick out of a, of, a, of a hat and say, well, this is the hammer against authoritarians and against those who, uh, uh, who destroy, you know, freedom, freedom of the press. Uh, but I think actually we did get one, and which, which is the, the conditionality regulation, which um, does not deal with media freedom, uh, unfortunately, from my perspective in a way, but deals with, uh, with rule of law, with corruption, and is weaker than, than it could have been, but, but it is something. Uh, so I, I guess my sort of more optimistic uh, perspective would be that, that of course, you know, the, if, if you have a government bent on dismantling, uh, you know, independent institutions, the judiciary, uh, free press, renationalizing, uh, you know, media, there, you know, if it, if it really wasn't do those things, uh, the European Union cannot stop it. It, it, it isn't, doesn't work like that. Uh, what it can do is create is, is raise the costs of doing so uh, for for that particular government. And I think with with these even sort of smaller and perhaps patchy instruments, the most important of which being the, reg the conditionality regulation, 
I think we might be able to raise costs high enough to slow it, slow down at least that, the, those tendencies, allow and, and allow for citizens of, of those member states um, and civil society and uh, and, and one of the elections to uh, to do the rest. So that's mm -hmm. kind of my slightly more optimistic vision of the future. Thank you. Thank you, Michal. And and before I give the mic to back to to you, Anna, uh, let me just point out one of the comments uh, we uh, actually a thread of comments that has been uh, also underscored in the latest remark by Ambassador Nigel Baker on um, on on the global perspective on on how to shape media environment which is under severe pressures first of all globally. And, and secondly, not only because of this particular abuses of, um, of authoritarians um, or uh, autocratic politicians uh, in Europe, but around the world, they may be simply abusing a situation that is much larger than their country, than even Europe, but it uh, refers to the global, uh, global condition in which media uh, have been thriving throughout the 20th century, but now there, there, needs, there need to be a, a readjustments. Um, weighting these two, a particular situation in Hungary, particular situation now in Poland, unfortunately, and in um, Slovenia, when you, know, when you see uh, what sort of uh, the outcome may be, how would you weight uh, you know, the, the importance of addressing particular problems, Anna, uh, you know, by the European Parliament, by EU legislation, and uh, particular problems related to particular country, par particular cases, and uh, framing uh, and, and relating to this, in, you know, more universal instruments that uh, here Nigel Baker uh, referred to, but also Sergei mentioned uh, earlier in, uh, you know, calling for instruments that would support journalism uh, um, systemically in, in, in the EU and across the world. So where's, where, how do you find the balance between obviously your country's perilous situation and the global question, the big question? Well, I mean, I, 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 you didn't ask an easy question to answer. If there would be an easy answer, then we wouldn't have this roundtable discussion today and most probably next week and for a long time, we're gonna have lots of discussions because it's a, it's, it's a complex issue. Um, I, I think the, the answer is just like uh, for, for the first question that unfortunately for a, for, for, for a lot of things, there's no direct solution. There is not a, a golden tool. There is not something we have to invent and then everything gonna turn, uh, turn right. Um, we have to um, put all the toolkits together in order to, to create more transparency. Uh, and and everything goes back, I believe, uh, roots back to, um, to to rule of law questions and democratic questions. How the institutions are balancing each other, and how the society is requiring to have an environment when this balance is there. Um, um, therefore, there is not a single um, uh, solution for that. And I think in that matter, there is no difference between local, regional, national, or global level. Um, and, and, uh, and, and I think right now, especially because uh, uh, at the end of the day, um, journalism is a global phenomenon. I mean, and, uh, I, now that the social media and everything uh, uh, involves, so now all the media markets uh, are, are working differently. Uh, everything goes back, not just to transparency, but also uh, um, um, the financing of journalism and, and advertisement market. Therefore, if we create uh, transparency in that uh, uh, sphere, uh, we can get close to the solution in a, in a, in a longer run. Uh, and there were also before the questions about direct funds. Uh, uh, and uh, I just wanted to, to name one which is indirectly uh, helps journalists and independent media is the rights and values program, which supports, for instance, uh, watchdog NGOs uh, and, and, and directly uh, it can benefit also uh, to, to protect uh, media freedom. But, but again, uh, those are nothing, we, we can't look for a uh, direct solution. I think all together uh, are going to, to build up for, for, for protecting media pluralism, but it's, it all goes way beyond uh, the, uh, the question of how to finance journalists. 
Now, uh, my final remark here, uh, we're sitting in, in front of uh, a fantastic audience, uh, uh, diplomats, uh, academics, uh, think tankers, but also many journalists, journalists. And I just wanted to ask everyone to reveal yourself on camera. Uh, we'll do a group photo, we'll do a screenshot. If you, if you allow that, please uh, just uh, let's, let's open up your cameras, um, put a nice smile. We'll do a, a shot and then we'll promote this debate uh, showing that there are European uh, parliamentarians who care about media freedom, not only in Central Europe, that, that discussion indeed goes global. Of course, it is on the EU level important. It is particularly important in, in several countries then, then the situation becomes so, so dire. Um, yeah, a few more, a few more um, uh, of you to, to turn on the camera. We're just missing, I, I think, I see uh, we're missing just uh, maybe uh, five people still, so. Um, yeah, I know it's hard at the end of the debate. Uh, the, I'm sure you look all fine. It's really lovely to see your 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 faces this morning. Keeps up uh, our you know spirits for the day. Uh, thanks, fantastic. Yes, I think my colleagues are also taking some photos. We'll use them also for uh, for social media, and again, uh, we'll refer um, to this debate uh, further on. Uh, this this was uh, the first of a series we we now launched with the European Parliament uh, to bring forward in the countries of Central Europe, Visegrad countries, the debates, the European debates um, uh, from the European Parliament to the national uh, public. We're partnering with, with uh, national, big national outlets in Visegrad countries. And we are very proud and very happy that you join us today. Anna, Anna Donat, uh, Hungary, Michal Simečka, Slovakia, Sergei Lagodinsky, Germany, European Union. Thank you. Have a good day. <laughs>